three, two, one. Gone are the days where each of us will work at the same job our entire lives. Each new chapter comes with new challenges, twists, and turns. From networking engineer to entrepreneur to early stage investor, today we talk with renowned technologist Eric Osaquan, who will talk about what he calls the series of accidents that led to his legendary career. We begin our conversation discussing how he discovered an opportunity to start his own startup while working his day job as a network engineer. He then delves into lessons learned from building a tech company on the African continent. We then discuss the high growth opportunities he is excited about and how new entrepreneurs can capture some of his magic. If you were ever fascinated by network infrastructure, early stage investing, or using your own knowledge base to solve a critical problem in your community, then this episode will give you lots of useful information. After the show, please go to our website at VentureTheWorld.com for additional information related to Eric and all of our other guests. Today, we are happy to get on the show Eric Osiakwan to join us on Venture the World. His background is truly the stuff of legends. You can't make it up. He is a networking engineer that is a true infrastructure technologist that brought much of Africa online by bringing down the cost of data, helping ISPs and connect subsea cables all around the continent. We also like to thank Megan McCormick of OSE and Sisu Tukor of eCampus and Alocious Atta of PharmaLine for submitting questions for today's interview. So without further ado, thank you, Eric, for being on the show. The pleasure is mine and thanks for inviting me. The first question I have is how did you go from being a networking engineer to an early stage investor at Chenzo Capital? Max, so that's a pretty good question. And I will say that I got into this accidentally, but you will see that in my, throughout my entire life, it's been a series of accidents. Most of them inspired by me following my instinct. And in the words of Sinatra, probably I did it my <laughs> own way. So in the manner of speaking, I first saw the computer in high school and immediately I got this instinct about it, that this is what I was going to be using, working with the rest of my life, whilst my dad wanted me to be a mechanical engineer. And that is a fight that we still have. So I started by building a few ISPs around the continent through my first consulting gig with the UNECA, through what they call the Africa Information Society Initiative. And that initiative was to create the Information Society in Africa. But we did a pre-study that pretty much concluded that Africa wasn't connected. So if we are not online, how do you then build an information society? So we convinced the UNECA to get into helping create connectivity across the continent. So as one of the guys who was hired to go around the continent, try to build up connectivity. And one of the cases we made was to support the establishment of internet service provider ISPs, which was the Davids to the Goliaths. And the Goliaths in those days were the incumbent telecom operators, the PTTs. One of the books that I wrote after that exercise was The Internet Diffusion in Africa looking at the politics. And one of the main premise of that book was this whole David Goliath relationships where the Davids were the small ISPs and the Goliaths were the big telcos that had access and they provide telephony and those type of services. Let me fast forward. So I did that for 10 years. So between 98 and 2008, I helped build about 14 businesses. During that period, I helped start the Ghana ISP Association, which was a trade association for the ISPs. I then also helped in founding the African ISP Association, which was an association of the ISPs across the continent. And the reason I did this was I realized that there was a need to create a trade front for the ISPs to lobby and to create space for themselves in the marketplace. And these organizations became very forceful in liberalizing the gateways in these markets and driving down significantly the cost of connectivity. I remember the Ghana ISP Association, we led the process in reducing the cost of megabit internet upstream connectivity by almost 60 to 70% in Ghana. And as a single ISP, you couldn't do that. But because we're a trade association, we're able to negotiate with the, the Goliath in this case and money to bring them down. So this exercise really led to the proliferation of downstream ISPs across multiple markets. But when we did that, one of the two things that I noticed was that the ISPs were not interconnected in the countries. In other words, there was no local internet fabric, no exchange points. And so 
even though there were a lot of ISPs, we were still transmitting local traffic internationally. So we got the African ISP to lead a process to set up internet exchange points, IXPs, in different countries. And then we end up with a big program called the Africa Internet Exchange System Access, which we lobby the African Union to become an African Union project. And currently is being funded by the African Union. And I think they've now built probably almost 45 internet exchange points and in some cases, regional internet connection points across Africa. And what these networks do is they create the local internet fabric. But there was a third thing that I saw happening towards 2008 was that even though we had created all this mesh network across Africa, we were still not connected to the global internet by very high speed fiber connections. Can you believe that in 2008, Africa had only one submarine cable connecting the whole continent? Oh, wow. And even though we had created a lot of traffic down here, we were all going up into a small pipe up there. So it's like a pyramid, right? So and around that same time, I'd got this fellowship to go to Stanford. And I was really, really lucky through this digital vision program fathered by the Routers Foundation. So my big thesis for that project was to look into how to expand the fiber infrastructure on the continent. So I went to study, I focused on studying and researching on open access models. Luckily, around the same time, the World Bank was looking into this issue. So I became a consultant to the World Bank. And we came up with what we call open access model for fiber infrastructure, for backbone infrastructure development. And when I came back, luckily, the Kenyan government that same year was looking to build a submarine fiber network. And so I became part of the team that founded the first submarine cable in East Africa called TEAMS, the East African Marine Systems. And so we built the first submarine cable in 07, 08. You know, when Kenya had election violence was when we planned and executed that submarine cable. So for me, that was a very strong climax of my telecom career that I got to help build the first, one of the first submarine cables on the continent. And then subsequently between 2008 and 2012, we had about 12 more submarine cables coming upstream. And with that, remember when we were building the submarine cables also was a mobile explosion. I wasn't involved a lot in the mobile world, but the MTNs, the Celtals, the Econects, and the Airtel, and all these guys created an incredible mobile explosion across the continent. And these mobile networks started connecting to the submarine cables that we built and delivering broadband. So now to transition, when I saw this happening, it struck me that the next thing would be to start investing in these new entrepreneurs that are going to be leveraging these platforms to create technology. That's when I started transitioning first, just as an advisor to a few startups here and there. And as a history will have it, I ended up becoming invested in some of them. And now I've focused my day job in investing in tech startups through chance of capital. I think a lot of people need to understand or don't understand that technology isn't magic. It's layers built upon layers, built upon infrastructure. So I'm really happy to have this discussion with you. One of the things that I've noticed from our discussion is that you seem to write or do extensive research, notice a trend, focus your efforts there, and then start building on top. Sort of like a pizza, build your layers and then you add the toppings. So you've seen a lot of yep. things over these past 20 years that you've been in the industry and tech ecosystem of Africa. What are the notable changes you mentioned? Some of them, what are some of the other changes that you have seen over this time? Well, the most remarkable change that I didn't focus on is the adoption of mobile. It was quite incredible because I remember, I mean, there were two phenomena before that. When the information society was being built, when we started creating this connectivity, I remember the study we did for UNEC was that the illiteracy is very high in Africa. The internet is in English. So how are people going to adopt online? People will not go online, right? And we've been proving wrong. The second, on the back of that is... I think the adoption of mobile, the way that illiterate people get on with a mobile device without even the need to read and write and being able to take that device and just start using it and going was very phenomenal. I think that those two phenomena have been very, very striking to me as a participant in this exercise. And one of my fears I had in those days was we may not be able to create the pervasive adoption that we had preached on the basis that there was strong illiteracy on a continent. As it were, technology has proven us right. So in some way, for me, that's very striking. The second most striking thing that has changed on the continent is a paradigm shift, a very powerful paradigm shift. In that, when I was going to school in Ghana, one of the phenomenon in my generation was that when you finished school, your parents, or when you were going to school, your parents wanted you to 
finish, get a white collar job, work for a big corporation or leave the continent, go to school in America and they stay there and then wire money back. Being an entrepreneur I was never anything that your family will encourage you to do. My personal story is that it took me probably the later years of my entrepreneurial career to tell my parents. Of my parents, you realize that I was an entrepreneur. They always thought I was working for some company. They never knew that was my company. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you country stories of some of the companies I've invested in where one of my most successful companies, the founder's parents once came to the office to visit and they thought they worked for some company. When they got there, the receptionist told them, no, own the company. And the parents couldn't <laughs> believe it. So these guys couldn't tell their parents that it was their own company. So for me, one of the most powerful paradigms that have shifted in my generation or one generation after me is this entrepreneurial spirit, is this phenomenon where the generation believe that they can create new companies. They can exercise their entrepreneurial instinct. They believe in themselves. They believe in creating something new as opposed to working for a company. And I'm not saying there's anything working for a company. But the reality is that we need to be on the creation side of the technology, not the consumption side of the technology. So the paradigm shit I'm talking about is this shift to the creation of technology, which has been very powerful because even when we built all these ISPs and we built all this connectivity and this submarine cables, a lot of it was that we were going online to consume technology that was developed from the West. But we've moved to a paradigm where we are now creating our own technology. So for me, it was a great honor that I could see this paradigm shift way before anybody saw it. In 2013 was when I really became a full-time angel investor. But actually, my first company that I invested in was in 2005. I was a company we used to call SMSG, it's now called Haptel. When these guys started a company, I actually was a friend to them. These two guys left college. Same guys, average Ghanaians, went to KNUST, one of the leading technology colleges here, and right after school started SMSGH. And they were the guys that I was talking about. They couldn't tell their parents it was their own company, but built a phenomenal company right out of college. And today that company is grossing $30 million last year. I went four countries. And this is a company started by two guys just out of Ghana, believing in themselves. And according to them, they came to a training program that I did in 2003 on entrepreneurship. And that's how they realized that they were entrepreneurs. And fast forward, when they started the company in 2005, they invited me to be an advisor. So actually that company, I didn't put money to that company. I was an advisor and I helped them a lot in figuring out the technology, the business model. And then they gave me some equity in exchange for the help I provided. So that's how I started my angel investing. And then subsequently, as I said, in 2013, I decided to focus more on backing these type of entrepreneurs. So generally I put in a little bit of capital, but focused a lot more on bringing my expertise, my experience to bear. Wow. So for me, this has been the second most incredible development that's happened on the continent, which then now connects to the technology infrastructure that is there. So I call it entrepreneurship meeting innovation. So it seems like you've built large scale projects and you've invested in companies in multiple countries across Africa. So I'm sure many entrepreneurs that will be listening to this podcast are thinking, what does it take to get an investment from you? So what are some of the lessons that you've learned along your way that has helped you recognize good early stage opportunities? So generally, the three criteria that everybody looks for, one is that you want to look for some semblance of a solution to a problem. So for the entrepreneurs listening, the basis of starting a company is solving a problem. And part of that process is when you have your own experience of the problem. Mm -hmm. And you begin to come up with a solution. And so every investor wants to see that you, the entrepreneur, has a solution to a problem. Now, what has become quite prominent also is, given that so many people are solving the same problem, the question every investor asks is, why is your solution unique? So it's not enough to have a solution or a product, but how unique is your product or your solution? Right, so that's one. And in some cases, you may not have the full product, but you may have a minimum viable product. In technology, that's what we look for. But that minimum viable product must be unique in itself. It must, how does it differentiate you from the others that are solving the same problem? And then once you have that, the investor wants to see that there's a market to monetize. So is there a market for this product that this entrepreneur has created? And that has to do with the fact that market monetization is very, very unique in the sense that it starts local and becomes global. In some cases, it's global right from the word go. Some cases, it's B2B and becomes B2C. Some cases, it's B2C and becomes B2B. So you, the entrepreneur, must be able to demonstrate your understanding not only of the product, but how to monetize the market. In other words, execution. A lot of entrepreneurs can postulate great ideas, but when you start getting into the execution part, it's hard. 
And the back of the execution is the team. So eventually, you see that there's a product, there's a market, but the investor is really going to be back in the team that is executing. So in a manner of speaking, I always say that when you have the product on the right side, the market on the left side, and the team is the pivot on which both of them stand. So execution is very critical in the entrepreneurial world. I tell entrepreneurs, it's not a contest of ideas, it's a contest of execution. Two people may have the same ideas, but one person may be executing better than the other. You go to a neighborhood, two restaurants next door to each other. One of them has a queue at the outside, the other one is empty. Why are those people not going to the restaurant next door? The difference is execution. Same idea, two restaurants. So at the end of the day, it's all execution. At the back of execution is the team. And so most of the time, I spend time getting to know the entrepreneurs, getting to understand how they think, getting to understand the ability to build a team. Yes, you may start alone, but eventually I want to understand that you can build a team and you can manage that team and you can grow that team. So it's a people game eventually. And that's what every eventual investor eventually pays attention to. And of course, David Ross did this famous TED talk that with some of the new tech companies, timing has become also a factor. So I'm sure you've seen that TED talk that he did, that companies like Facebook, Uber, Twitter, Airbnb are not new ideas. The difference is that they got the timing right. So timing has also become a factor that investors look at. We had an incoming question from one of your investees. CISO of Ecamp has had a question that he wanted you to explain why you chose to invest in his company. And can you provide some of the context for that investment and what you were most excited about that investment that you can share with the public? I was most excited with Cecil about his entrepreneurial savviness and his commitment to that venture. And I have seen EdTech is, is a very hard space. It's a very hard space to monetize. And Cecil has been on this for more than five years and finally figured out the business model that works. So I've always believed in him because I thought that he as an entrepreneur will have a very tough skin. And if anybody can get EdTech right, he could get it right. And he's proving me right in building a company and also building a very unique team that is on track to become a very successful company. And as you can see now with the COVID situation, most people are going online to learn. And now in-campus numbers are spiking incredibly. But he's really stayed the course for this to come around. And so for me, that's the most exciting thing. So as an investor, and I've seen your portfolio, you have hospitality to agriculture, to even ed tech, like you just mentioned, and you invest from a Pan-African perspective. Can you share some of the risk assessments that you give your portfolio founders as they enter new markets? Because some of them have entered and grown outside of where they originally were based. Yeah, and some of them have also not succeeded. <laughs> so <laughs> the good news is that a lot of them have succeeded. But so the interesting thing about Africa is that Africa has some interesting dynamics. It looks very similar, but the nuances are very different, right? So the way a business functions in Ghana is very different from the way it functions in Nigeria. But if you look on the surface, you think Ghana and Nigeria are very similar. So if I got a business model right in Ghana, I could just copy it and paste it in Nigeria and it should work. No, you're wrong. The nuances are very different. It's the same way if you take a business from Ghana into East Africa. East Africa is significantly different from Southern Africa. So the risk here is execution risk. And that risk is profoundly reduced by your understanding and partnering with local people that understand the local culture of how business is done. So I believe that technology and business always thrive in a cultural context. So the biggest risk is understanding those dynamics and then fine tuning your business model and your technology to address that because you cannot change culture and you cannot change business culture, how people do things. What you need to do is that you need to figure out how the technology and the business model fits that. And this is the most important thing that I have learned over my career, building companies across Africa. And I try to translate that to entrepreneurs. Back in 2015, when Monique Water visited Nigeria as a partner at 500 Startups, she stated that Africa's strongest investment was infrastructure. So while you've been investing in infrastructure and building up projects, what are some of the future infrastructure opportunities and what early stage sectors that you think will be able to build on top of what you've built? A lot of Africa is still not connected. Broadband is not in every part of Africa. So I still believe that the mobile operators extending connectivity to semi-urban and rural areas is a big opportunity. But again, the dynamics around how you do that is very different from creating mobile 
and connectivity businesses in economic centers or urban areas. So there's a big opportunity there to create more infrastructure in those places. And I think that we're beginning to see more and more unique models around that. I still also think that the connectivity infrastructure within Africa represents also a great opportunity because Africa is still not very interconnected. But with a common market that is being created by the recent agreement signed by the 54 African countries, I think there's a great opportunity to create intra-Africa infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, etc. So those are areas that I think if you want to invest, you pay attention to from the infrastructure point of view. In the entrepreneurial side, I think that generally we've seen a lot of investment opportunities in fintech. So fintech has been a leading area. One of the things that we've seen with this COVID-19 situation with the growth of e-commerce. So we're going to see more and more e-commerce. We're going to see more and more business going online and more and more people buying and selling online. So e-commerce, I see e-commerce and fintech, by the way. We classify e-commerce and fintech together. And we also classify logistics around fintech. So it's funny see, that you do that because I do the same thing. We don't see it just as payment. We see it as delivery of services. So e-commerce, payment, the logistics around that, all that we see that thing. So that is a very, very big opportunity area. And I think that there's going to be a lot of investments going there. The second area is that we're going to see a lot more investments going to Arctic. And as you know, Pharma Line is one of our companies. And we're going to see a lot more companies in that segment because the reality is that you're going to see the modernizing of agriculture right? You're going to see more and more subsistence farmers using technology in the way they grow, the way they harvest, the way they process, and the way they take food to the market. So companies like Twigger are proving that. And you're going to see more and more companies doing that type of stuff. You're going to also see a great deal of investment going to health tech. COVID-19 is already revealing this strongly. One of the companies on whose board I said here in Ghana, but I'm not an investee, is a company, it's a leading private hospital called Nyaho Medical Center which has been here for 50 years this year. I mean, this hospital was started before I was born. But the new CEO, who is the son of the founder, his vision is to integrate technology into the healthcare practice. And so he invited me to join the board. And so I've been working with the board to see how we can use technology as an integral part of healthcare delivery. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that type of opportunity across the continent, partly because of the lack of sufficient healthcare infrastructure. So leveraging technology will become a very, very ubiquitous approach. And then you're going to see also a lot of investment in supply chain, logistics, and that type of stuff, because these are sectors in Africa that have a lot of challenges. So those are the areas that we are paying attention to. The last area that we are really paying attention to is clean turf. So with renewables, climate change, and all this stuff, you're going to see a lot of renewable opportunities. So for example, we believe strongly that in Africa, the grid is going to become a lot of mini microgrids in rural and semi-urban areas. Because the central grid is going to be hard to sustain across most countries in Africa. So you're going to see the emergence. You've already seen this in a lot of places with mini grid and micro grids. And you're going to see how technology and mobile money is going to be used in delivering that, those forms of energy to those underserved communities. So clean tech is an area you're going to see a lot of opportunity that we as a fund are paying attention to. Thank you. We really appreciate you being on today. It's really amazing to see how your career arc has led to your investments management career and your VC. So we're glad to have you on and we're looking forward to having you on in the future. I know that you'll probably have some funding announcements or some investments that you would like to share with us in the future. We definitely want to invite you back on for those. So thank you for being on Venture of the World today and we look forward to having you back. Thanks a lot and I look forward to another conversation. Three, two, one. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. To find more episodes, visit venturetheworld.com. You can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at VTW underscore HQ. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review, which will help other listeners like you venture the world. Thanks.